Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's illustrated lecture. My name is Alicia Fure, and I'm the Learning and Audience Engagement Manager here at Geelong Gallery. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wadawurrung people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the land I am currently on, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. To coincide with Geelong Gallery's current exhibition, Frederick McCubbin, Whisperings in Wattle Bows, Senior Research Curator at the Museum of Old and New Art, Jane Clark will present an illustrated lecture exploring Impressionism in Australia, beginning with the establishment of an outdoor painting camp at Box Hill in 1885 with Frederick McCubbin and fellow artists Tom Roberts and Louis Abrahams, investigating a mysterious French episode and on his turn of the century work in the bush at Mount Macedon, where he told Roberts he found life, colour, charm and pictures everywhere. Jane Clark has previously held positions as curator of major special exhibitions and of Australian art at the National Gallery of Victoria, and then deputy chairman of Sotheby's in Australia. Co-curated the 1985 to 1986 exhibition Golden Summers, Heidelberg and Beyond for the National Gallery of Victoria and its national tour. Could you please give a warm virtual welcome to Jane Clark? Thanks, Jane. Well, thank you, Alicia, and thank you to all these people that I can't see. Um, I'm going to mute myself in a minute so that you can just see the paintings um, and then hopefully come back at the end if anybody's got questions. So I'll see if I can do that now. Yes. So sometime in the 1870s, Tom Roberts asked fellow student, art student, Frederick McCubbin, home for supper after a day sketching along the Yarra River. Mrs. Roberts, Tom's mum, asked the 20-something Fred, well, and what is your forte? My son's is landscape. Mine is figure drawing, McCubbin replied, even though he'd had virtually no access to a live model at that point. And of course, in the event, it turned out that both artists' forte was very much the figure in the landscape. At that point, McCubbin had been an art student already for 10 long years, first at a local men, working men's design school and then at the National Gallery of Victoria's Drawing School. And uh, this is a portrait by another student, John Summers. McCubbin then also enrolled in the gallery's painting school for at least another six years. And he was always having to earn his living at the same time. He came from a humble working class background and studied usually at night and worked at the same time. At the time of that supper, Roberts had been making copies of lithographs by the English landscape painter, James Duffield Harding. And these were atmospheric landscape and tree studies. McCubbin, the wannabe figure painter, was frustrated by the lack of any serious teaching and absorbed anything he could, mostly from British art, from John Flaxman's engravings of human anatomy, and he even copied down all the names of the muscles and bones, to Turner's Rivers of France, all, black, all in black and white, of course, printed engravings from paintings that were already very famous for their colour. McCubbin also soon started on Duffield Harding's Lessons on Trees. He also read the British art critic John Ruskin, and he said, Ruskin's enthusiasm for nature made us look at it with more reverence. He also read Homer, Shakespeare, and even copied photographs of ancient Greek ruins because he had ambitions to paint history. As he later wrote in a rather lovely memoir of his youth, we were a parcel of young Australians, anxious to do something in the picture making way, but absolutely stranded as to how to set about it. And then Roberts left to study in Europe in 1881. It was a dark time, McCubbin remembered, and it was not really until Roberts's return in 1885 that McCubbin really began to feel part of something new and feel that he had a way forward in his art. We know that Roberts had written him regular letters about studying at the Royal Academy in London and actually brought a painting home about studying in the Royal Academy in London. And presumably he also wrote to McCubbin something of his travels in France and Spain and the art that he saw. We don't actually think though that Roberts saw paintings at all by any of the leading artists that we now consider the key French impressionists. 
The original French Impressionist exhibition had, of course, taken place quite a long time before, in 1874, so 10 years before Roberts was in France and England. And this was this thoroughly annoyed the art critics of the day um, and the art establishment, and the artists were deliberately independent of the older official exhibition system of the Paris Salon. Claude Monet, Camille Pizarro, Renoir, Degas, Bert Morisot and others had all rejected that smooth, glossy, highly finished style of the older generation. And they exhibited together as a group for many years, well, over several years until 1886. But Impressionism was never a homogeneous movement with any formal program or any idea. Um, unified, clearly defined principles, and neither, it's very important to understand, is it an exclusively French phenomenon? The term seems to have originated in France to describe that group of younger, more progressive painters, basically opposed to the old fashioned academic training and historical made up subject matter. But James McNeil Wisner, American born and London based, artist provocateur par excellence, was called an Impressionist and called himself an Impressionist. And by the later 19th century, the primary aim of what we might label realist, naturalist and Impressionist painters of that time was to record their own surroundings, nature and life, experienced as immediately and truly as possible. And that was whether they lived in France, Great Britain, Scandinavia, Spain, America or Australia. And interestingly, often with a good dose of national sentiment thrown in, this was the 19th century was the century of national uh, identity and nation states. So these were the ideas that Roberts brought home from Europe and shared with McCubbin, as did a number of other 1880s arrivals from the Northern Hemisphere, just to give you a few examples. Julian Ashton from England, John Mather from Scotland, Artur Lureiru from Portugal via Paris. And here's Roberts, not long after he got back, painting boomtime marvellous Melbourne as a busy place for well-dressed well young women going about their business. And you can see it is a slice of life, almost like a photograph, painted quite quickly, not glossy, not academic at all. It's an Australian impression. Artists' society sprang up in the 1880s with regular artist-run exhibitions. And most importantly, the younger artists took their paints, their oil paints, not just their watercolors, their oil paints and their canvases out into the landscape to paint on the spot. En plein air is the French term in the open air. And this was consciously sweeping fresh air through their art. This is Tom Roberts's painting, The Artist Camp at Box Hill. And this camp was over the summer of 1885 and 1886. So the summer after he got back from Europe. Paintings by Roberts, the subjects are Louis, Louis Abraham's grilling the chops and McCubbin sitting there next to the tent. This is an image of intimacy with the bush. They're camping there. They haven't just gone out for the day. And you, you can't, there's not even a horizon. They're right embedded in the bush. Interestingly, they had gone out by train. So it's quite likely that the station is not that far through the trees, but it was still farmland then. They were all city boys. They were working during the week and camping in the weekends and in the summer. You can also see in the entrance to the tent, quite a large canvas propped up to dry. And this is a statement about what they were doing because the older Australian generation of artists might have taken their oil paints and their pencils outside and sketched on the spot privately for something that they were going to work on later in their studio, but they wouldn't have considered that something done outdoors in a tent on that scale was finished and suitable for public display. And one interesting thing that you might realize, both the capacity to paint conveniently out of doors far away from the city studio and the tendency to work quickly and apply paint quite freely and extravagantly only date from the invention of collapsible tin paint tubes. Previously, artist colors were sold in pig's bladders and they were ground and mixed laboriously by the artists themselves. They were also, a lot of them were poisoned. 
but from the mid 1800s, artists could buy clean portable tubes filled with thick buttery pigments, ideally suited to that thicker impasto and the more expressive broad brush strokes. And the brushes were new too. Flat brushes with a metal ferrule were invented in the 19th century so that for the first time, painters had a choice between the old round brushes used since the Renaissance, I suppose, and these flat square tip models, which made an entirely different kind of brush stroke, broader, flat, and evenly loaded with pigment. And you could also lay on the paint with a palette knife if you wanted a more textured effect. And this was a technique that frankly, and overtly declares itself, deliberately revealing how the artist's creating the illusion and therefore inviting us as viewers to almost participate in that process ourselves. So here are two paintings from McCubbin's time at that same Box Hill artist camp, Lost and at the Falling of the Year. You can see the paintings just don't look like Monet's, but why should Impressionism have to be French? Distinctive atmosphere is what McCubbin was after here, and I really think he achieves it. You can almost smell the gum leaves. If you really need a stylistic art historical label, insofar as art historical labels are even useful, perhaps this is international tonal impressionism. It has a photographic feel, not only because of that snapshot slice of life effect, but also in the effect that it emphasizes the tonal values rather than, using, rather than using color to dissolve away form in the way that say Monet would have been doing by 1886. This tonal impression really is very well suited to the soft grays and greens and browns of the Australian bush. It captures this particular distinctively local conditions under an even grayish light. And if you go in an even grayish light, your shadows aren't going to move as much. You can spin longer in the bush and capture what you're seeing. Roberts had come home reportedly, I quote, primed with whatever was the latest in art, the gospel of relative values. Tonal values, my dear boy, values, he apparently reiterated to McCubbin. Now McCubbin's self-portrait which I love, dated 1886, so presumably painted after the Box Hill summer camp, because he's not in summer clothes, sees him straddling two worlds. He's just been appointed drawing master at the National Gallery School. He's actually still a student in the painting school, but almost graduated. So he had to show that he could draw, and the dull, dark background is absolutely what his boss there would have taught, the NGV director and painting school chief, George Follingsby. But look at those paintbrushes. They're flat, wide and square-ended for bold impressionist strokes, and they're just sneakily loaded with a light-coloured paint. And surely that pink shirt, it's got stripes, and the cameo neck pin, a public servant, McCubbin's quiet bohemian gestures to the contemporary. I reckon he used those flat square brushes outdoors at Box Hill to paint the sky in Lost. By 1888, a critic in the newspaper, Melbourne newspaper Table Talk, probably the journalist Sophie Osman could write, I quote, how curious it is that some of our best artists, Messrs. Tom Roberts, McCubbin and Streeton, are all a little touched by the mania which afflicts the French Impressionists. I don't write this in disparagement of the three gentlemen. I admire their landscapes in spite of what I consider their incompleteness. She couldn't help herself. She thought she shouldn't love them, but she did love them. In fact, it's very important to understand that the young Melbourne artists had not been at all touched, as Miss Osmond put it, at first hand, but they were certainly aware second or even third hand of how internationally the Impressionist movement had spread and how varied its manifestations could be, mostly through reading magazines, often only reading descriptions, not even seeing images. And when there were images, of course, they were black and white. As well, Roberts corresponded with John Russell, who had a Sydney artist who was now in France and had actually met Monet, and also Emmanuel Phillips Fox, Melbourne artist, sent examples of his own work, and he had French training with, a French, with an American French impressionist. He sent work home from Paris for exhibitions here in Melbourne, so they did see a bit, but it was secondhand. <laughs> 
Now, by this time, Arthur Streeton had also got, joined their group, painting with them along Port Phillip Bay. And then it was Streeton who secured the lease of the old house at Eagle Want that gave the Melbourne Impressionists their other localised art historical name, the Heidelberg School. We know that McCubbin didn't get out to Heidelberg as much as the bachelors, but he was presumably there at weekends and on day trips. It was in 1889 that this group of young artists in Melbourne first called themselves Impressionists. On the 17th of August, 1889, their carefully marketed show opened at Buxton's Art Gallery, right opposite the Melbourne Town Hall in Swanson Street, and they called it the Nine by Five Impression Exhibition. As I'm sure most of you know, the title came from the fact that most of the artworks measured about nine by five inches, and many of them were painted on the lids of wooden cigar boxes. And you can actually see, for example, in that framed one, which is an original style frame, the way they did them, that they, they used the wood of the cigar boxes as part of the, the warm um, textured background. This exhibition was partly intended to annoy the most conservative of Melbourne's art critics. They'd already been using the term impressionist to mean unfinished, as we've seen, and the most conservative of them by, um, had the corollary that that also meant lazy and slapdash. But the exhibition was also intended to appeal to local buyers because the art loving, loving public had read those same magazines and the fashion news from England and Europe and America as the artists had. So again, they knew in theory, secondhand, about Impressionism. The pictures were small and the prices were low. In London, Roberts had seen a Whistler exhibition of small impressions, nine by fives, that attracted a lot of media attention. So he and Streeton and Charles Condo, the other ringleaders, wrote letters to the paper, hosted journalists, hired musicians, and laid on afternoon tea for the opening. But where Roberts submitted 62 of these nine by five exhibits, Condor 46 and Street and 40, McCubbin put in only five paintings. And very sadly, none of them seem to have survived. I'm intrigued by the title of his catalogue number 177 here on the last page, Still Glides the Stream. It's a quote from the English poet Wordsworth and Streeton appears to have lifted it a year later for his own five foot canvas, Still Glides the Stream and Shall Forever Glide. And incidentally, it was our lovely man, Fred McCubbin, who took the Art Gallery of New South Wales trustees to see Streeton's version, big version in an exhibition. And it was thus McCubbin who brought about its purchase for Sydney. And another interesting point, a so-called trio of lady artists who were sharing studio space with Roberts had also, according to Table Talk, caught the impression fever. They were Jane Sutherland, Jane Price and Clara Southern, and they'd painted numerous impressions, according to Table Talk, which somehow ended up reported on as not intended for exhibition. One wonders why chauvinistic gendered art politics is my best guess. So although we haven't found any of those five nine by fives from the nine by five exhibition, Roberts did paint a few, uh, sorry, McCubbin did certainly paint some small oil on cigar box lid impressions, such as this gorgeous Petit Dejeuner. But in 1889, what he was really doing, much more characteristically, just a few months before, he had it proudly exhibited down on his luck. Here, the smoke and the distance impart an atmosphere, tonal impressionist. Uh, kind of style, but the figure of the destitute traveller is almost pasted onto the landscape. It's clearly a carefully posed studio job and Louis Abrahams was his patient model. I can only presume that McCubbin, torn between friendship and career, a government employee as gallery, sc gallery school drawing master and now with a wife to support and a child on the way, simply didn't feel he could align himself too loudly with what newspapers called the daring young impressionists of Melbourne. By stage managing their nine by five exhibition like Whistler, 
they were aligning themselves with his famously anti-establishment attitude. Whistler's court battle with an art critic for libel certainly made news here in Australia, and the gallery trustees would have been aware if McCubbin was aligning himself too much with that kind of thing. You need to remember that the crossest critic, the most um, belligerent critic of the 9 by 5 Impressions exhibition was the Argus newspaper's art critic James Smith, and James Smith was also a powerful trustee of the NGV where McCubbin worked. And anyway, he'd spent so many painstaking years acquiring excellence in figure painting, this kind of excellence in figure painting. He always put so much importance on learning and on training. It must have been really hard to let that go too quickly. You can see the same thing really happening in Roberts's Shearing the Rams started that same year. And of course, also in the Bush burial, although here I think the figures, he has managed to integrate them superbly much more with the landscape. And of course, both these artists, Robert and McCubbin, were hoping that their most ambitious, their really big works would be purchased for public collections, specifically for the NGV and the Art Gallery of New South Wales. They also hoped that they would be seen, Roberts was hoping to send Shearing the Rams overseas to the Royal Academy, and probably would have, except that he managed to sell it first. And Arthur Streeton sent Golden Summer Eaglemont to both the Royal Academy and the Paris Salon. Here in the Bush Burial, I think, McCubbin was also responding to a question rhetorically posed by a visiting American lecturer and art critic named Sidney Dickinson. What should Australian artists paint? Dickinson asked this and then answered in a long article, and I'll quote it at a bit of length because I think McCubbin, of all of them, took it most to heart. To increase the public interest in art is the particular duty of the artist. Surely no country in the world has so much that could attract attention to a new artistic sensation as Australia. And every school of art that has become great attained its position by describing what it found most commonly and most familiarly about it, the mixed life of the city and the characteristic life of the station and bush. It should be at the ambition of our artists to present on canvas the earnestness, rigor, pathos and heroism of the life that is about them. These qualities exist if we will but open our eyes to them and to assist this awakening is one of the highest missions for our painters. And Dickinson went on, it's to be hoped that Mr. Roberts, Mr. McCubbin and the others who have been impressed with the opportunities for pictorial description which lie in Australian life will not be discouraged either by silent indifference or outspoken criticism, but persevere in an effort which speaks more hopefully for Australian art than almost any other that has ever been inaugurated. He was quite wordy, but I think McCubbin was listening. We know that McCubbin staged this whole sad scene to paint it from life, probably somewhere out near the site of the Box Hill Artist Camp. His wife, Annie, is posing for the woman in black. The older bearded pioneer was someone he actually just met in the street in town and um, invited to be a model because he looked so like a pioneer. And the younger mourner is said to be Louis Abrahams again, although personally, I think he looks a bit too tall and well muscled for Abrahams. But of course, in a painting that you were doing over many painting sessions, as McCubbin would have this, you could have more than one model, unlike an on-the-spot small impression where you're capturing it in half an hour or so. Dickinson, who lived in Melbourne for about five years and became the secretary of the Victorian Artists Society, which was the main artist society in Melbourne, also wrote a rather impassioned letter to the Argus praising bush burial as of more than ordinary importance and the first dominant note that had been heard in purely Australian art. The proper purchaser would be the National Gallery, he said, which of course took no notice of the suggestion, luckily for Geelong. And then James Smith, trustee as well as art critic, you remember, having already reviewed the painting quite warmly in the same newspaper, re retaliated in a published response that it was very kind of Mr. Dickinson to come all the way from America to enlighten our darkness and instruct our ignorance, but the Melbourne press is not quite so owl-eyed as he wishes us to believe. 
James Smith called the bush burial a poem without words, both touching and tender. But even more touching and tender is the bush idyll painted in 1893 and this time painted at Blackburn where McCubbin, McCubbin had moved his young family not very long before. You can just see Blackburn Lake through the trees there. These aren't French peasants, these two, but they were obviously influenced by French rustic subjects such as this one. This is painted by Jules Bastien Lepage, which, and McCubbin certainly knew the painting in reproduction. It was actually reproduced as a photograph in art magazines at the time, and it was bought by a wealthy Australian in London. Um, this is really characteristic, absolutely typical of Bastien Lepage's work with its atmospheric, slightly impressionist landscape in the distance and a very high horizon line, and then large scale figures that are rather romanticized, consciously localized, and reputedly all painted in the open air on site. Bastien Lepage had become something of a a real international plein airist hero when he died young in 1884, really because of this, um, this combination of impressionist landscape and well-drawn figures. And he was seen as a modern heir to Corot and to Millet and the earlier French Barbizon school. And we also know that McCubbin read his biography published in 1892 and recommended it to Roberts to read as well. Here in Bush Idyll again, the enveloping soft grey light and details such as the close focus foliage, the gum leaves there are very like the weeds in the front of the Bastien Lepage, not to mention the boots, are distinctive characteristics that you see in paintings of countless country children by Bastien Lepage and his many international naturalist successes. And here you can see the kind of um, you know, group group thought or <laughs> they just all look so similar they look like a family past Bastien Lepage's Parmesh then an American follower and then a British follower all doing very much the same thing at very much the same time and here are two pages from McCubbin's scrapbook um, and at the lower right you can see Clausen's Girl at the Gate, the British follower, most famous British follower of Le Bastien Lepage. And actually on another page, there is a work by Bastien Lepage, which is now in the NGV. And then up in the upper left there, you can see Titian's Flora. And we know that McCubbin, when he was a student, used to see a copy of Titian's Flora, Flora in upstairs in the window of a pub in Melbourne. Um, shining in the light up there and he says he used to look up and think brave heart there I lead on brave heart and I follow so he also put a black and white version in his scrapbook Dickinson said that what McCubbin really needed was further training in Europe preferably France and he wrote this in the paper a few times but it was not to be rather remarkably though and we'll see rather mysteriously this most obviously French inspired painting did make the journey to Paris. McCubbin didn't at this point, but the painting did. Although McCubbin sent Bush Idle to two exhibitions in Melbourne, it was the depth of the 1890s depression and it just didn't sell. And it also was a terrible time for McCubbin. His baby girl died in an ex accident of a head injury in 1894. And it must have just been a kind of time when he really didn't know what to do. But then the painting appeared in the Salon, the Paris Salon exhibition in 1896. I discovered this almost by accident because his name is misspelled in the catalogue F.M. Kerbin instead of F. McCubbin, and its French title is An Australian Idyll. McCubbin never travelled overseas anywhere himself until 11 years after this in 1907. And the painting's acceptance by the Salon was actually reported quite widely in Australia, and that was my first clue. The news came through as um, telegraph reports. It wasn't written up in any of the art columns, but it was in the telegraph news. But how did it happen? Maybe one of his Australian expatriate artist friends in Paris organised its entry to the Salon, which was a very prestigious thing for any Australian to be part of, especially one who was living 12,000 miles away. <laughs> 
We know Emma Minnie Boyd and Charles Condor helped Streeton get Golden Summer exhibited in London and Paris years before Streeton ever got there himself. In this 1896 salon, we know there were also works by the Australian expatriates Rupert Bunny, Abby Olson, and Florence Fuller, and they'd all known McCubbin well in Melbourne before they went overseas. And then as for how this very large painting was shipped, McCubbin was definitely not a wealthy man. His salary at the gallery was so poor that he was allowed to exhibit works in his studio, his galleries, National Gallery of Victoria's teaching studio and sell them. So it has to have been down to some friend or benefactor. My guess, and it is entirely a guess, is his kind and much loved friend, Louis Abrahams, who was reasonably wealthy and who eventually bought the painting from, from McCubbin for his own collection a few years later, we think 1899. And I suspect Florence Fuller could have had some hand in it too. She'd been a student with McCubbin. She was a woman of some means and she was also influential or perhaps paid enough to have her own entry illustrated in the Salon catalogue. And we also know that she shipped some of her own paintings in the other direction that same year, paintings she'd done in Paris to be shown in Melbourne. Louis Abraham's owned a number of paintings by McCubbin and his portrait painted by McCubbin in 1901, which would have been just after he acquired Bush Idol. And then after Abraham's tragically committed suicide, his widow Golda continued to support McCubbin, most notably by the, with the purchase of the wood saw to help the long awaited 1907 trip to Europe. Um, and the wood saw, of course, is in, in this exhibition also. Louis Abrahams named his son Frederick and McCubbin called his firstborn son Louis in return. And Louis was the model for the man sawing wood in the wood saw. Bushido also, I must tell you, has a fascinating later history. It was bought from Abraham's estate sale by Hugh D. McIntosh also known as Huge Deal Macintosh, a Sydney sporting and show business entrepreneur and newspaper proprietor. The painting went with Huge Deal to England in the 1920s because after the First World War, Macintosh leased Lord Kitchener's house, Broom Park near Canterbury, not only brought Bush Idol over, but laid a cricket pitch there with soil from Bulai in New South Wales. And then it seems the painting was completely forgotten until its discovery with an art dealer in Cambridge in 1984 and its inclusion in Golden Summer's exhibition a year after that. Where it was between huge deal and the picture dealer in Cambridge, we've never found out. Now, I'm not going to say a lot about the pioneer because I hope most of you are going to come and hear Michael Varco Cox reveal all the secret stories behind this one. Except to say in the words of the Australasian Art Review back then, that it's the epitome of that union of landscape and bush episode which McCubbin made his own. He painted it at Mount Macedon, where he and Annie had bought a cottage in 1901, and he supposedly painted most, most of it outdoors on the spot. It's huge, so that was quite an achievement, but it was something he really wanted to do, partly because he knew Bastien Lepage had supposedly done this thing. And Macedon was one of the happiest places in his life, and he wrote to Tom Roberts, the bush up our way looks more charming than ever, pictures everywhere. McCuppen would never have thought of himself as a radical. In fact, I think he always felt part of the great Western tradition where Titian and Turner were the great master of colour and he could only hope to follow from afar. But he was always open to new experiences as an artist. I think his teaching at the gallery school kept him interested in what younger painters were discovering and he was beloved by his students for it. And importantly, McCubbin was able to absorb themes and stylistic influences without ever compromising his own vision and never really compromising also the fact that he felt his art was a high mission as Sidney Dickinson had asked Australian artists for those years before. 
he was serious, but he was fun. You know, he loved fancy dress, for example, and he told jokes and he sang. He was quite, he was, I think he was a really nice bloke. And now we need to go overseas. With McCubbin on his first and only time away from Australia for six months in 1907, and that's a postcard from Prince Heinrich, which is when what he went on. As well as Golda Abraham's financial help, his gallery students had apparently co collected up a pouch of 100 gold sovereigns, which is a lot of money in those days, and they'd also given him a Gladstone travelling bag inscri inscribed with his name. In his time away, which was mostly spent in England, his letters home reveal most, more than anything, how much he missed his darling sweetheart and their children. But he does also tell Annie about the art he saw in Paris, in Paris and in England. In Paris, he stayed with Phillips Fox and artist wife Ethel Carrick, and he wrote home about Duvie de Chavanne, quiet, tender color, and the Impressionists, some of them very, very fine, Manet and Monet, Sisley, very fine. And he also noted Pizarro, whose painting had just not long come to the National Gallery of Victoria. Most of all, though, he was bowled over by the old masters, Titian, Rubens, Constable, and his boyhood hero, Turner, now in London at last in full colour. And these are views of the Turner Gallery at the National Gallery in London, which is where he spent so much time. On the late paintings of Turner, McCubbin wrote, such dreams of colour, no theatrical effect, but mist and cloud and sea and land drenched in light. And although they are most unfinished, they are divine. His time in Europe also made him realise, he said, we have more colour in our landscape than they have in England and much more light. And it really took going away from Australia going to somewhere where it was darker. And he, he was there over the summer, so he was seeing England at its most light, but it was going away that made him understand what Australian light and colour meant for him as an artist. And when he got home, he changed his whole palette. Instead of the tonal blue, gray, green palette that we've mostly seen until now, he began to use bright blues and yellows, and pinks, purples, reds, and a big variety of vivid greens. As always, his response was inspiration, not imitation. He was totally reinvigorated. And importantly, the local critics of this new 20th century loved his new and totally Australian impressions. There's no more criticism of unfinished slapdash anything like that. This was Impressionism and thought of as Australian Impressionism. Many of the smaller intimate glimpses of the landscape in these later years, the sort on the, on the left there, the later years of McCubbin's life, they worked partly with the palette knife. Writing again to Roberts, who was living back in England by this time, he said, the older I get, the wider my, the wider my interest grows in all life, colour, charm, my dear Tom, in our past work, we have been too timid. And here at Mount Masson again, you can see forests that have been extensively logged, but still included mountain ash, messmate, peppermint, manna gum, and white gum trees. And this is where McCubbin lived, right in this landscape. And this little girl, who's probably his daughter, is not likely to be lost at all. As his first biographer, Anne Galbally says, in his late works, McCubbin's art is an art of joy and celebration of the basic fundamentals of picture making in a continuing dynamic with his own environment. And as 21st century artist Helen Breck or Helen Maudsley has rightly asked, what other Australian artist has such an inventive and complex mind for us, the viewers, to engage with? Thank you. I feel I've maybe raced through that, so I'm happy to answer questions. Oops. Hi, Jane. Sorry, I'm just getting my thank you. I'm just coming back online. Hi. Well, thank you so much, Jane, for that exhibition, um, for that wonderful overview of Impressionism in Australia and also a fascinating insight into McCubbin's life and practice. 
Um, do we have any questions for Jane? If you just wanted to pop it down in the chat box, we'd be more than happy to read them out. Well, no thank questions. you, Amanda Bead. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Amanda Bead. Oh, here we go. Um, the previous, um, Anne Marie would be interested to know about the previous two works. These two? So those are paintings that he painted after, I'm just going to try and move the chat, after he got back quite um, late in his career at Mount Macedon, by which time he was actually using the place at Mount Macedon, which he called Fontainebleau after the forest of Barbizon, a forest of Fontainebleau near Barbizon, where French painters had painted in the 1830s. Um, and he was using that place more at weekends and holidays and living in Melbourne and still teaching. So, but he had a studio out there. So Violet and Gold, for example, it's a big painting. Uh, there are a lot of small paintings which would appear to be kind of working studies for those light effects. Um, and I would think he would have tried to paint most of it outdoors. He seems to have tried to stick with that, but it is quite layered. You can see he come, has come back to it. It's not all done in one sitting and probably the same with the child in the bush. The other thing he used to do then he often painted on a white ground over the canvas uh, to make much more light come through. And sometimes he would paint a layer and then rub it back. And you see this in violet and gold, actually, if you look closely, I think, from memory. I haven't seen the exhibition yet, but I do know the painting. Um, he used to paint quite a thick white layer and sometimes paint a bit more colour and then rub the canvas back with a pumice to give it a kind of a almost gesso like surface and then paint layers again. So you get this effect of veils of colour, I guess. Does that help? <laughs> and, the, and the little girl is obviously a theme that he did from, um, yeah, from the 1880s onwards. He did another one of a boy lost in the bush, which is in the National Gallery. I don't think it's in the exhibition. And then this very sweet one where I don't think she's lost at all. She's probably in their garden. How were his students affected by the new style? Um, gosh, well, because he was the drawing master, a lot of his students were like him, very keen to be good draftsmen. And there was a, a traveling scholarship offered by the National Gallery of Victoria. And the winners of that always um, in this time that he was the teacher and right into the 20th century tended to be big figure paintings. So they, as students probably um, followed his ambition to be a figure painter, but a lot of them did paint landscape later. And certainly the idea of an Australian impressionism, well, it's still really going, but if you think about 20th century, mid 20th century art of um, a lot of followers, Charles Wheeler, John Loxton, really almost, it almost became you could say a bit of a cliche into the 20th century when, when contemporary modernism came. He died in 1915, so he didn't live, 1915, 1917, anyway, one of those, but he didn't even live till after the First World War, which was when there became this kind of battle between traditionalism and modernism. And I'm not sure what he would have done. I don't think he would have enjoyed it. Um, he never seemed to have really wanted to be part of a group. So I don't know how much that really answers. And, and also in terms of how his students were affected by his new style, I think that it wasn't only him that would have given his students a new and growing interest in colour, because you really had the beginnings of modern modernist colour particularly in Sydney with Roy de Mestre, right about the same time or in the years coming past, had people like Dashilo Rubo, um, great colorist who in, in Sydney as well. Uh, so he was probably 
part of a big movement towards colour and light and abstraction. Um, we've got a few questions now coming in. I'm just going to answer them just by, uh, I believe, Jason. Jane, can you say something about McCubbin as a colourist? Um, well, I, I guess, I, um, well, I guess at the, in his early career, he wasn't a great deal of a colourist. I mean, he was obviously interested in colour. He was interested in trying to transcribe the colours of the Australian bush and doing that in a quite literal tonal way. But as he went on, and even beginning before he went um, overseas, but particularly afterwards, I think he became much more interested in colour for its own sake and almost playing with colour. So you get these beautiful rainbow passages of paint in things like um, that one that I showed right at the end, that detail, that's a detail from, I don't think, it might even be from that child in Bush, I think. I can't remember. I just went through <laughs> some of his paintings. Certainly the one I showed at the front was the detail of the bracken there. So much more playing with putting pure colour on uh, rather than trying to mix colours. And, and also that idea of dissolving form in colour. But he was still always, I think, essentially a tonalist as well. You don't get the effect of a Monet haystack or a Rouen cathedral. I think he was, he was probably still more interested in Turner than in Monet, I think. We also had another question. Um, how many children did Frederick McCubbin have? And I he had six. He had six children. Um, and the question about lost, it's said to be inspired by the story of Clara Crosby, but I'm not sure that he ever said that. I'm not sure whether that's just that people have said that that happened at the time and therefore it was, or whether he said it was, because it was, it's quite possibly was, but it was a theme that colonial artists had already used quite extensively. S.T. Gill, the gold fields artist, did um, pictures of children lost in the bush. It was the, the terror of colonial Europeans in the landscape that your child would wander off. I mean, there was the terrible story of the three little boys who were found asleep in a hollow gum who had died. So um, yes, it may have been triggered by that particular story, but it was something that was painted by earlier colonial artists and also quite frequently seen in stories in the illustrated black and white press, which we know is something that McCubbin was aware of. And in fact, these artists actually drew for the black and white illustrated press as well as sometimes being inspired by, by that. Um, and yes, I think it, it is overdrawn, the idea that they're the first properly Australian school of art. It comes from a few things. They are the first um, generation, most of whom were actually born in this country. So McCubbin was, Streeton was, Roberts wasn't, but he came here as a child. Uh, whereas the older generation of people like Follingsby, Von Garage, Valier, Bouvelot, um, had all, all been born overseas. So there was that. Um, they came to maturity in the decade of the first uh, century since the first fleet. So there were these centennial celebrations of European settlement here. Um, and there was quite a bit, not only Dickinson calling for this idea of a national school, it was something that was spoken about in, um, in the American art world as well as here and elsewhere, this idea that um, each place and each climate and each um, environment could create a national school of art. It was a, a very 19th century phenomenon. So, I guess they consciously were trying to do that. The idea that, you know, Von Gerard and Bouvelot peered through European spectacles, I think is a bit ridiculous. If you think of Glover, uh, John Glover in Tasmania and his art was totally transformed 
when you compare his English subjects to his Australian, he certainly wasn't peering through English spectacles. Um, so yes, it is overdone. And I think uh, it also in the lead up to Federation, these almost more grand, quite romantic landscapes like violet or gold um, were seen as quite national. And then it was reiterated, I think, after the First World War, when you got almost a reactionary looking back to this supposed golden age of settlement and art in the face of modernism. And then the other thing I think that's affected it is the kind of cult of impressionism. Um, so although, as I've tried to show briefly, impressionism was a pretty global phenomenon in Western art, the French origins of it uh, were given such primacy in art history in the 20th century. And this is down to not only the writing of art history, it's also to do with the collecting of American museums. The American collectors and museums collected French Impressionist paintings in a big way, much, much more than here, much more than in Britain. And that was then kind of written into history that this idea that somehow great art went from center to center so that it went from Paris in the late 19th century to New York in the 20th century and that there was some trajectory and of course when you actually look at paintings and you actually look at what people were doing it's all much more complicated than that but I think that does lead into a bit of this um, heroization of this generation. They are lovely pictures though I mean they're documents of colonialism but um, they're, they do have a sense of an intimacy with the environment, I think, that gives them a lasting appeal. Thank you, Jane. And thank you, everybody, um, for joining us this evening. Some great questions. Thanks again, Jane. Um, please join us again. Um, we're joined by senior creator Lisa Sullivan on Thursday, the 28th of October from 5 p.m for an illustrated lecture online and go behind the scenes with Lisa and learn about the development of Frederick McCubbin's Whisperings in Wattle Bows, an exhibition that celebrates the first major work to enter the Geelong Gallery collection in 1900, McCubbin's A Bush Burial. The exhibition brings together McCubbin's key pioneer subjects and additional paintings that elaborate the artist's unending fascination with color and the nature of the bush. Thanks again, everybody, and thank you, Jane. Good evening.